Previously on 94 Chill, the podcast. This is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Dracula the terrifying, the feared, who sleeps in the tombs of the dead by day and arises at night to inflict his terror upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. You must help me. You must. You're my only hope. You must. I'll help you. Please try and understand. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. How do you destroy a fiend who has so far proven himself indestructible? Those who come to end his reign of terror stay to become his victims. Castle Dracula is summoned here in Klausenberg. Will you tell me how I get there? You ordered a meal, sir. As an innkeeper, it's my duty to serve you. When you've eaten, I ask you to go and leave us in peace. This is the doctor who dares to challenge the vampire Dracula. This is the anguished man who fears for the lives of his beloved, the girl who is his sister, and the one that is his wife. Dracula, the bedeviled master of all that is evil. such terrible fear and such haunting desire Dracula Oh God, help my poor soul Sanctuary! Dracula Rated R And that funky jazz has probably blown my ears out. So, hey, you were looking for a short conversation anyhow, Rory. So, <laughs> but this is 90 for Chill Podcast. I'm just chatting along with my older sister, the poetic critic on Letterboxd. That's the poetic critic. You see, it always just throws me off because you got the two C's. Like, I know living, like, I can never just see myself with a Russ Stevens email address. I, I mean, I need that underscore. I mean, like, we all know two S's is too, too much. Or one too much. But uh, three, that's that's just right out. Now I'm thinking about it, and I might as well just say five. One, two, five. Three, sir. <laughs> but, um, so basically again doing some letterbox stalking of my older sister's profile and her diary um i have um uh, gotten around to all the dracula i think she's gotten a hold of recently so i ended up with a drunken uh, double feature for me last night and i think uh you really gotta look at the ratings i think before you plan your double feature out like you know, you want to do, you want to leave on a good note. And, you know, I just, um, all I can say is the Dracula by the guy who did Short Circuit and War Games was not the right one to end on. Historically, though, um, well, 1979's Dracula from Universal Pictures, um, is a little too long for the podcast qualification, but the film I watched prior, the... I don't know, the first real modern Dracula, perhaps? Well, the Horror of Dracula, the title, it was 
given on HBO Max, but 1958's with Christopher Lee's first appearance as. Yeah, Horror of Dracula is what it's known as in the U.S., but mm. in the U.K., it is just known as Dracula. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there are some... I've heard, though this might not be the entire reason, that Universal has some rights issues to just the title Dracula. That wouldn't surprise me, but... And that this probably had... That might have had more to do with why they called it Bram Stoker's Dracula in 92 than anything else. That was what Roger Ebert said. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've heard conflicting discussions as to why that was that particular case was the one it was. But yeah, in the UK, the first Hammer Dracula movie is just called Dracula. Okay, that's, that's what I was... You now, eventually I was able to find officially, like, mm -hmm. just really pain in the butt talking to my itunes and siri you yeah. know um yes so that's the hammer i mean that's pretty much what but i would say but they did movies prior to that i understand that i mean they pretty much were the universal of horror on in england pretty pretty much um i mean what what it is it is interesting that in that stretch between the 1930s and to the late 50s, Universal's take on the, the public domain horror characters or just concepts was that ingrained, although that makes sense if you remember that the film, that run of movies continued well into the 1940s. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, in effect, uh, Hammer got on the map by basically doing some of that material again but in a way that allowed for more violence and sensuality than had been allowed at that time. Mm -hmm. Especially because, keeping in mind that in the U.S. we still had the Hays Code going back then. Right. American filmmakers wouldn't have had that kind of leeway. Mm -hmm. And this was a big thing. One of the things that's part of why the Hays Code crumbled in the 60s was because we were getting more imports from other countries that had more sex violence and what have you and they were proving very very popular and that included the hammer horror films and the early james bond movies mm -hmm. which were as violent and sexual as you could get at the time yeah for most audiences right i'm kind of thinking with that thing about the Hayes code it kind of brings me back to the one time we um my ex-girlfriend cindy my best friend uh stephanie and her um boyfriend at the time watched uh uh valley of the dolls <laughs> and uh that's pretty much the um sharon tate character is the one who went over to do the nudie films and is now trying to establish herself back in hollywood right and then yeah sharon tate and like I don't know. There's this sense of foreshadowing. Oh, yeah. She's going to end up getting caught in a brutal murder, but I digress. When they ran the movie on Fox Movie Channel at the turn of the millennium, mm -hmm. which is how I saw it because Valley of the Dolls is one of the key camp films of yeah. the un oh, I... quasi-unintentional manner, I suppose, right. which... looking at it. Uh, they did it with, it was one movies they showed with these little pop-up video texts oh, with okay. info about the film, and yeah, when they get to... The, the last scene for Tate's character, they do bring up what happened to her in real life. Mm -hmm. and it, the meta sense is pretty sad. There were actually a fair deal of sad outcomes for people associated with that movie. I mean, uh, Jacqueline Suzanne didn't live that long comparatively. She, I think she passed, she passed away in the early 70s and only published two more novels. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a, a sense it's almost cruel that Roger Ebert went and created the ultimate camp movie, the sequel, which he, I mean... Yeah, with I Russ Mayer, yeah. Yeah. The I'm, Valley of the Dolls. Right, and I mean, it's not like an entertaining watch, but you know he's nailing every point right. Well, if you've seen enough late 60s studio movies that were trying to get, understand this youth culture thing. Oh, uh, okay. It's not all that different, but it's a lot more knowing about it. Yeah. You've so. seen act. I mean, there were a lot of. That is a fascinating time. I know some of my film Twitter acquaintances feel this way too. Is that the late 60s studio movies, as the 
system, old system is falling apart and they know there is this youth culture that's going out to see movies like Easy Rider and, and all the indie films that were kind of getting first on trend, like Roger, a lot of Roger Corman yeah. films were, do, were managing that. And the major studios were making attempts to try and get that kind of energy in their movies. And there's some really weird results, whether they were supposed to be taken seriously or not. Because mm. I'm a big Peter Sellers fan, yeah. for those who don't know. And he actually did have a fair amount of interaction with the counterculture in the late Sockisties. But even some... And I love you, Alice B. Toklas, which is comedy about a square guy who... Uh, in a roundabout way becomes part of the hippie movement. Right. And it's one... And it's something of a fan favorite in the serious seller circles. It's very good. They recently... TCM likes to show it every now and again. Okay. They're, they're very fond of it. That's one of the better ones. Mm -hmm. But then you get something like uh, The Magic Christian, which is this wackadoodle spectacular about the world's richest man adopting a homeless guy, which is Sellers adopting Ringo Starr as his son. <laughs> oh, that, That's, that... And it becomes a series of sketches, which, which is basically they go around... And force pe and convince people to humiliate themselves for money. It's almost a sketch movie in that sense. And by the end, it gets to a wild finale on a cruise ship full of nouveau riche people, and all sorts of weird. Christopher Lee has a cameo as a porter who turns out to be Dracula. <laughs> oh well, no. That's typical I mean... of, and typical of how weird the ending gets. It gets very random in the last half huh. hour. Oh, well, I mean. <laughs> Well, then that's a throwaway gag as <laughs> Christopher really shows up. <laughs> well, um, okay. Well, and it's it works only in hidden misses. Mm -hmm. Another one from the, at this time Warner Brothers did was one called The Finks, P H Y N X, I believe, which is about the U.S. government dealing with a crisis where all the great American icons of entertainment ranging from Colonel Sanders to the uh, Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger, to the Busby Berkeley showgirls, and so forth. And these people are all playing themselves, are being kidnapped by the Romanian government in an attempt to kill the American spirit. So the American government's solution, because they had suggested by one of the many people they have infiltrating pretty much every square and hip movement there is is that create a rock the world's biggest rock group can that is so popular they will be asked to go to romania and have them smuggle everybody out of the country hmm. and that movie also has tons of weird throwaway cameos like james brown and richard pryor have like blink and you'll miss it bits <laughs> so overly ambitious version of uh scavenger hunt really uh, I mean, and like, oh, and there's that guy. And... That, there is a big feeling of there's that guy in a lot of these late 60s movies. Mm -hmm. you look up the cast list for Candy sometime. Oh, I think I have, but yeah. <laughs> or even the, night, the, the night, parody the, Casino the, Royale, Royale got into right. this. Yep. And so you had a lot of these movies. And these were like the more lighthearted, satirical ones. Mm -hmm. The ones that were trying to be more serious, I guess, are even worse. Well, you know... And so Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, if you've seen just a few of what was being put out by that point, you can see where Russ Meyer and company would go and just do the goofiest version of it possible. Right. <laughs> yeah, we get a decapitation and then somebody gets to walk. Yay! Well, but I think it was... Uh, Brad Jones is the cinema snob reviewed it, I think, and it has a line... So Z-Man decapitates a guy while the 20th Century Fox logo is playing. Roger Ebert might be the greatest screenwriter of all time. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but I guess you'd say in modern terms, it was kind of like all the horror reboots we had um, mm -hmm. late aughts. Um, the, like, kind of missed the point why I think, I think the problem with like your uh, Michael Bay produced horror movies from the uh, later part of the um, aughts was that 
oh no 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 we don't need jokes it's a horror movie it's like no we enjoyed this for the sheer ridiculousness of it yeah that's why i love jason x i mean it's not a good movie by any stretch of the imagination but it's very much aware that it's not a good movie right um but getting let's go from that roundabout discussion back to talking about dracula movies. right now you had you had the perfect bit with the chris just mentioning christopher lee and it's like yeah but i have that tangent and yeah that's oh. a good tangent <laughs> yep so um yeah so the um speaking of the Hayes code i did like write down a top 10 list uh, well 10 items for each feature that i um got so What's your blood preference? Are you into the uh, syrupy, like, possessor, or the paint, like, hammer films? Uh, I think syrupy is more fantastical in nature. Mm. But the paint approach, you do, can get more vivid colors that way, oh, which is very important. Yes, no, Dario Argento is big on the paint. Yeah. Well, that, there's some of that in uh, Tim Burton's Sweeney Todd, too, and it's hard not to think that wasn't deliberate. Well, thinking about that, that was another thing I had on this. Um, was Michael Goh's casting as Alfred pretty much a tribute to it the Hammer be anything films? Anything else? Yeah, I mean, he also shows up in uh, Sleepy Hollow. I was gonna say, but I was just thinking, well, you got Dracula, the Batman, <laughs> um, and Batman. So, um, all right, so two knocked off on that. Um, so I will say. Um, well, actually watching this, I'm thinking, you know, during the hammering of me, uh, like I get it, it, this, this experience double header really made me want to watch Bram Stoker's, which I haven't watched from beginning to end. Cause it's yep. like, I really need to get my names straight. Like we're okay. So Har um, Harker, I always thought was engaged to Mina and Ever since the Universal version, at least, there's been a strange tendency for all the character names to get mixed up. Yeah, okay, I'm just making sure. And, um, you know, Harker being a vampire hunter, and not a very good one. Like, all right, do I kill Dracula before the sun rises or <laughs> sunsets? Or do I kill the kill the um, henchwoman? And I had that as a note, and that's like, no, I gotta keep it the 10, but... I'm not really cooked down with how the henchwoman died. Like, okay, she turns into... She ages when she's killed. Shouldn't them boobs be all the way down to her bloody knees by that point? Game of Thrones did not back down on that when we had the entire um, Alessandra nude scene end of before she goes and revives Jon Snow. Yeah, I'm just... I see what you're saying about having not seen a movie from start to finish because there are some movies that just seem to turn up on cable all the time oh and yeah you watch them out of order like that which is how i saw pretty much all of dracula 79 back in the day oh, okay. it was really popular on the stars channels for a while hmm. so now i guess another thing i caught from this uh watching dracula 58 is perhaps all cops are bad i mean uh fidelis et morton um, faithful, faithful till death. Yeah, is the NYPD's <laughs> motto. Um, so you know, uh, Michael Go and uh, basically, I don't. A problem with the vampire hunters when I'm after watching movies like Lair of the White Worm right. is like mm, Capaldi and Grant probably the best hunting duo I've seen. Glenn Erickson at DVD Savant said, you know, he was disappointed by how that movie ended because he would have watched a series about all these characters doing fun stuff down. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so go and, uh, go and, uh, Cushing, not quite the same thing, but far more competent than, uh, Laurence Olivier. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that is the biggest problem with Dracula 79 is I'm cheering for Dracula. You know, like, Har Harker is a total dipshit. <laughs> um, Laurence Olivier, like, okay, this is, like, no, man, you were old and decrepit Nazi dude two years ago. Like, well, in between, he played a Nazi hunter. 
Oh. In the boys from Brazil. Oh, yeah. Forgot that one's in between there. Yep. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, there's nothing to scream home about Olivier's performance in this. Yeah. Um, Donald Pleasance is a little too normal for my taste. I mean, this is a, this is a horror movie. This is where you... Um, well... I, and, okay. I think Dracula 79 it definitely has a place in the vampire canon. And that's one of the first movies that tr- tries to look at the Dracula thing with some sympathy. Mm-hmm. But as the wonderful uh, Moria Reviews dot com Moria Reviews site, uh, the science fiction, horror, and fantasy film review, a gigantic site that works out in New Zealand, okay. puts it as interesting as they try to see put some new spins on the traditional vampire thing. It means it doesn't really work as a horror film because it's too, it winds up being too restrained because they don't know how to portray Dracula sympathetically with, without kind of neutering what he does. Yeah, I mean it's the. I guess part of this is that. Uh, Frank Langella and John Badham, the director, had pretty conflicting ideas how they wanted to approach this thing. Because Langella, who was coming, who was going to this from Broadway, not unlike how Bela Lugosi got into films, because mm. he played Dracula on stage and had, was very well known. And Langella had been in a Broadway revival of the play that the original that Lugosi had been in. And which is what the Universal film in 1930s was based on. And uh, Langella saw it as a much more, wanted to take a much more romantic approach to it. Mm. And Badham apparently didn't quite feel the same way. All right. So there's kind of this push pull going on. So is that why Ali Sheedy doesn't kiss anybody in either of her films with Badham, be it War Games or. Short circuit. I don't know. I wouldn't know what to say about that. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, a little bit of romance. I mean, unless Johnny, unless Johnny, Johnny Five was, uh, you know, had attachments. There, I mean, right. you, you need a little more Gutenberg and Sheedy. Well, and you see the push pull also with Dracula because you were asking me about this, and it was which version I've seen. Is it the one, the original color scheme? Or the desaturated one that was first used, I think, in the 1992 Laserdisc, yeah, which Badham helped supervise. Because Badham's idea was he wanted to shoot the movie in black and white. Right, no, that, that's Universal more than Fisher obvious. Said, no, we don't want you to do that. That's we, We're spending a lot of money on this production. Because this was a huge release for Universal mm-hmm. in 79. Uh, it was one of their big summer releases. And... Only recently, by way of Shout Factory, has the version with the original color scheme been made available again. Okay. Um, it, yeah, the, their Blu-ray release has uh, the desaturated version on the first, I think, the first disc, and the uh, original version with the original colors on a second disc. Yeah, I I can say that I was impressed that they were able to do that in 1992. Mm-hmm. But this is one of those, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And now you're slapping out a lunchbox. And, sorry, just tried my best gold bloom there. Yeah. Well, there, you can do a whole, we can do a whole episode about, you know, early colorization mm. or other strange approaches that were taken with older movies. Right. In the early, in the, back in the VHS era, you could do a whole show on oh, that. Oh, jeez. Like, no, I, my, um... That was one thing we couldn't get back in uh, 2001 when I was taking my first film course. And that was uh, Angels with Dirty dirty Faces and a lot of apologies from the instructor. Because <laughs> it was the colorized version. <laughs> basically, if you want, basically, if you just want a description of that, watch Dick Tracy. Because that's me. pretty much how the, like, well, how do we uh, put the colors in here? Well, what did they do in the Dick Tracy comics? That's mo- that's mob stuff. Well, part of the problem with the early colorization is it was not uncommon for the people working on these to go back to find whatever color photos they could find at the production and try and duplicate those colors. Mm-hmm. But, of course, 
The reason the colors were chosen was how they would film in black and white. Right. Roger Ebert discussed oh, this no, often. Oh, it's no, the, it's the classic. And the result is that they're not going to look right if you bring them in, if you colorize well, them that it's, way. Well, it's the classic um, con- photo shared, like, this is the Adams Family's house, mm-hmm. and it's all pastels. Yeah. And, like, and, um, I had something else, but, eh. Um, I mean, it's just really, once you got digital colorization, I mean, when you could do it all digitally, like the Coen brothers pioneered with, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, and then just totally taking out the colors and, that, and uh... And that became a whole can of worms. I don't know about that, like, I love the man who wasn't there just because of the... I'm talking more about how it became. It was one of those things that every filmmaker started. Oh no! Again, as I that. as I say, we like um, I don't know. We need a film course dedicated solely to the thoughts of Ian Malcolm. You know, I I don't know if we could make a semester out of it. Yeah, but I was gonna say it's. Well, I mean, you could take pretty much. There's just should be a course on Jeff Goldblum. Period. Everything you can learn from the fly. Everything, you know. Everything. That actually could be interesting. Yeah, everything it would be like an accepted where there's a cl- one of the classes is the rise and fall of Chevy Chase. Uh, you see, I've <laughs> never watched accepted. I mean, the trailer was just too Sorry. stupid with the... All right, let's just cut the Jonah, Jonah, Jonah Hill in a hot dog suit. Like, come on. But, uh, but everything's like, I don't know, like Jonah Hill... I think with the exception of Moneyball, is pretty much like, hmm, we got to make sure this is a comedy. Let's show him just totally change his persona just for the main character, be it Justin Long and Accepted or uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. yeah. I'm going back to Dracula 79. Okay. There's some interesting stuff about it. It's one of the only Dracula movies I've seen with a car chase in it. <laughs> Like they, I, I don't I, I know prefer- why they moved up the story a few decades it's, except to yeah. put a car chase in it. Well, and it just doesn't work as well as the the um, carriage chase and yeah, and, and other ver- and, you know and Dracula the stuff you 58. Have in other versions. I mean, especially I mean that that kind of Dracula fifty eight w- was aware that it's a camp concept, and I think Dracula seventy nine not so much. They were no, they, no it's one of that's. We occasionally get the these kind of adaptations that just seem to want to leech all the inherent fun out of the material. Drew McWeeny and Scott Weinberg on 80s All Over discussed this with relation to uh, Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes from 1984. Yeah, Christopher Lambert is just inherently funny in my opinion. And I love Christopher Lambert. It's like, but... I think this is one... That's one of the things why Santa Claus the movie has this... The hate them that it has. Oh, it should because it's trying to pl- play a Santa Claus movie as more of a superhero movie, and that it just seems kind of weird. I know that Weinberg is doing an episode of his Patreon podcast, Overhated, about this movie, and apparently he and Kevin Murphy, the guest star, really tear into it, and that feeling that it's overhated as a podcast about famous flops well, and whether they yeah. deserve their reputations right and you have a similar podcast from jessica quaz and joe harper with yeah. uh second chance movies right so um no i i don't know it's like listening to screen drafts that it, um the baseball draft yeah. and after all the controversy of no you can't put you can't just leave a league of their own at number seven no, you can't go and just leave the sand. You can't. Sandlot shouldn't be in there as long as there's bad news bears. Still listening to the podcast. I don't know if, what ends up. Uh, and then they end up with the natural, mm-hmm. and a lot of love for the natural. Yeah. And then you got to yes, Commissioner Brian Cogman. He basically like, no, it's just very cheesy and everything, which is what I have always felt the natural. But what I'm getting at is, a lot of the time. When you see something like uh, Santa Claus the movie turn something into a superhero, that that might work today because everything's supposed to be a superhero now. Yeah, you do wonder how some of these older flops would play now. I mean, well, mm-hmm. it's often joked that 
technically like the, the first na- Marvel the- theatrical movie is Howard the Duck. Right. Um, and people who get to go to the ranch love to try getting a picture with Howard. Um, but I got that from the ID10T Hardwick and, right. and the guy who did the uh, controversial behind the rides show now. <laughs> um, so. I but, will say with Dracula 79 that I think that John Williams scores seriously oh, gosh, slept no, on. No, no. The, from the first beat. Yeah. You I know mean, this is good. Like, you are pumped. I mean, it, it, this was, I mean, that was some pretty... Just getting Williams alone to do your Dracula movie, that would be a pretty big thing in 1979, but he just brings it home. If nothing mm. else, that is a gr- that is a slept-on score. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, uh, 79 asked a question I came up with for uh, 58, which was, had anybody nailed down the lid on a vampire coffin just for kicks? <laughs> let me out, let me out! It's a classic... What if R. J. Fletcher Sr. was here right now? What would he say? <laughs> Let me out of this box. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Um, There's a scene in uh, Carl Theodore Dreyer's 1932 film, Vampire, where a character finds themselves stuck in a coffin with a window and is basically seeing their own funeral, if I remember correctly. Ah. So that's a little different. Yeah. 79, talking about how what a big deal the Dracula movie was, I mean... There were a ton of vampire-related films in 1979. Well, you had um, Love at First Bite, the and producer, you had uh, Werner, Her- Werner ha- yeah. Herzog's. No- Nosferatu the Vampire yep. came out that year, Werner Herzog. And Which is weird. There's just a random post, big-ass poster sitting backstage at the Madison Theater. I hope it didn't get burned down in the f- recent fire mm-hmm. uh, for um, Nosferatu the Vampire. Mm-hmm. Just, just a Madison, Madison Theater... Somebody win the lotto. Somebody fix that joint. I want the Smashing Pumpkins back in Peoria. Thank you. And Love and First Fight was a big hit for one of AIP's last big hits. And it actually got to theaters before the Universal Dracula did. And people, including the Walter Mersch, who produced the Universal film, said that might have hurt their movie's chances at the box office. No, the big being, comedy about Dracula. Yeah, I just mean, come out. I mean, I don't. I really need to watch, rewatch Mars Attack. Um, but you know, after Independence Day came out, it. I read a little earlier this year. You know, Independence Day did just turn twenty five this year. Oh yeah, and they did an oral history, mm. and the creatives admitted that they. That they knew they had to get their movie out first before Mars Attacks. Well, I don't think Mars Attacks would have been the... But no, it would have pro- totally neutered. Yeah. I, you know, if we're already laughing at the yeah. concept. Right. There were other movies involving vampires in one way or another in 1979. There was... Uh, even before Love at First Fight, there was the disco vampire comedy Nocturna. Yes. No, you, we were talking about that softcore mm-hmm. porn on a... Um, previous po- i think the one that we have actually dropped we will drop her last conversation where i kind of went ultra heavy on heavy on dead dogs long live cats and um actually that's something um just bring up possessor again cat jumps on the table early on in the film they remove the cat whole family dies justice for the cat okay so yeah i'm and there was uh There was also a film called Nightwing, which was not about vampires, but about vampire bats in Mm. uh, the desert. And uh, Nick Mancuso plays a hero out to stop them. I think David Warner's in that one, too. Uh, David Warner and vampires. That's... uh... Haven't gotten around to that mm-hmm. one back from like '86. My best friend's a vampire. Was that what it was called, or something like that? There were a lot of va- vampire comedies, but that might have been that might be the one. Like, okay, there were a ton. Remember? Oh no, we had after uh, once... Ghostbusters. Yeah. There was kind of that. There was a wave of horror comedies trying to cash in on Young Frankenstein in the '70s, mm. and then you had the post Ghostbusters wave in the '80s. Yep. Um, Everybody was trying to find an angle on uh, spooks after that. Right. Movie. And um, 
you know, horror never really got that. I mean, all you had was the scary movie franchise, and that's yeah. just all over the bloody place. You can't yeah. even really say it's about horror. I think part of it is that horror and comedy have share so many of some of the base concepts. I mean, they go well so well together as is. Well, and that just sometimes look, spoofing them seems redundant. Well, and everybody was complaining about Freddy Krueger getting more funny yeah. mm-hmm. as the as jokier the, as that jo- franchise right. can, can and be. then um ch- child's play is pretty much nothing but straight up satire now mm-hmm. um i mean i know uh there's a lot of love for uh seed of chucky and i thought oh, okay that one's just a little way too weird but as i say there's a lot of love that made this slasher's draft uh of the early of the aughts right on screen drafts um so just for one. Now, special effects wise, I'm going with 58. Yeah, that's a lower budget film, but it gets a lot of use out of what it has. Like the same thing goes with their uh, another film I've been watching this month because you know it's spooky season. You're watching horror movies. Is the first of their Frankenstein series, mm-hmm. and that's also effective in that way. It, but with uh, Dracula 79, there are some effective bits like the wolf trance. Yeah, the wolf trance. Through the window is very pretty yeah. good for seventy nine, mm-hmm. um, but yeah the the big scene where Dracula bites yeah. in this version Lucy, I'm told I, if I remember correctly they got the they got the laser machine from the Who because <laughs> they were touring at the time. Okay, they I was it I was them. thinking I was thinking very much. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, we're going so we're stuck uh, we're stuck at this point with. Um, Victor and um, Robert Forster, we're going through the black hole. That's what I got during that sex scene. Yeah. I mean. Um, let's... It, it is another thing that when you're trying to do upscale horror like this, and I'm not meaning this, what they now call elevated horror. Mm, yeah. Uh, but when you were trying to do upscale horror, you were not necessarily be going to focus so much on your effects work, I suppose. Yeah. At least not back then. Right. I mean... We were like two years away from, or so away from the big special effects right. makeup revolution. In 81 with yeah, um, the, the, the American the werewolf. werewolf in London. And then you had and a lot Halloween. of people... Right. That's... Yep. Um, right. And it just kind of sucks. Like, Terminator... I don't want to say James Cameron ruins everything, but the morphing kind of just ruined a lot of just effects, period. The 80s was a rough time. <laughs> oh, the 80s... Def- well, no, 80s was prime for... It's once we had CGI and the... Well, that's every- what I mean. Okay. The transitional period of the 90s... Uh is very very rough i mean it's virtually the entire decade yeah i mean i know spawn was a new line movie and this was before lord of the ring so Mm -hmm. cheap shit that's what they did did but (laughs) dude goro was more into like oh come on i mean you look at how well the 80s practical effects hold up now right i mean last week uh tcm ran in prime time uh Little Shop of Horrors eighty six. Oh, and um, you know, somehow that movie doesn't hit me like it hits other people. But you cannot deny the effects. Yeah, I think the score is a banger. It's not one of my favorite musicals, but it is an amazing score. And the it's score is great. Effects, effects work, especially because I'm not big on a, a lot of the songs. Film, but... Like suddenly Seymour, um, but or the entire dream sequence like these are pretty lame ass songs my opinion uh i mean suddenly seymour works best when you have jim uh jim belushi to go and shit on it now now see for the the died in the wolf fans that's the song that makes the show i mean it it does have an emotional torque to it i i i I get yeah i get that but it's, it's almost transcended in that way considering it's rick moranis singing out of it yeah and it, and it does manage to work i 
I, I don't know. I'm just like, I am very much in the vein. Like I had a difficult, and I had the same problem with Hercules and its songs. It's like, I, I'm not, I guess I just don't have a thing for 50 styling in my stuff. No, 50s musicals were musicals. And they were probably... Now, about 80s musicals, I do tend to gravitate more towards the ones that le- that are le- lean into or are the straight-up comedies. I'm, I've am mm. i talked about how much I like Earth Girls Are Easy, which is another one. Right. That... We're, uh, I'm working on, on, okay, if it doesn't have a stinger at the end of the credits, maybe I should be a little more L- lenient. Fl- lenient. Yeah. Well, that's up to you. Right. Well, we'll... You know, we're, we're, we're trying to get 50 podcasts in by the end of the year. It's going to be, you know, like, I'm going to have to probably expand it at some point. Um, but anyway, going back, um, the, but yeah, 80s special effects, um, when they're really well done, mm. they're, they're pretty mind blowing. And if they're not well done, they're at least more fun to make tease than bad cgi yes no i will take i mean gosh it's almost makes you glad that david cronenberg hasn't really done body horror since existence that's big x and big z um yeah so i mean i don't want to see him screwed up with cg there is a bit near the end of maps to the stars involving fire that doesn't quite take as well as it could well, as practical no, fact yeah nobody it's not yeah. enough to ruin the movie but right but so many people do fire bad mm-hmm. is i mean when when did uh the auteur frankenstein start make getting his word like is he filling in for the uh is he filling in like well there's a there's a with the wine scenes being out somebody's got to fill in the steam Fire bad. Fire expensive. <laughs> and we can all agree upon that. Like, like, as long as you're not, like, you watch enough bad, really bad movies. I mean, the movies that helped inspire me to write my uh, pro wrestling zombie comedy designed for a Z budget, Man of the Dead, ask for a treatment at rustthebus07 at gmail.com that's r-u-s-s-t-h-e-b-u-s-0-7 at gmail.com um and i'll also take advice on how to get it out of developmental hell um like yeah i mean and they're going to and they get thrown through the glass and the glass no the glass is there that's cg mm-hmm. i watched sharknado and it's like Almost, there, there's a way to make Sharknado work. It does not, not what they did. And um, chainsawing, I mean, I don't think they were smart enough to think the chainsawing the shark to get a person who was con- sw- swallowed by one should have been a nice tribute to early Peter Jackson, like uh, Bad Taste and uh, Dead Alive. No, I'm just, I don't think they had that in mind. So, um, let me just take a look at my notes. <laughs> Go plug to Suave Vampire. I mean, I can understand why mom's all about Frank Langella. Yeah. Why she wouldn't go to see Matt, why she made dad go to Masters of the Universe, I don't know. Um, which is something I really have to rewatch. Like, um, Allie has got her fire stick figured out. Of course, I bought one, like, okay, I need one to own just so I can troubleshoot Rory yeah. and the kids and Allie. Um, she's got Netflix. She threw me off, like, I got the fire stick working. and Okay, good. So you have your music on it? You just hooked it up to the Wi-Fi? Well, I haven't checked for my music, but I had just hooked it up to the Wi-Fi and subscribed. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, there's no subscription because I had to go break down all these old email accounts of hers. To get to get it optimized. Oh no no! I subscribed to Netflix, so okay. So we got to get Ali's password at some point, or I do. But I digress. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, otherwise, I said I watched Possessor recently, and 
you know, it only la it just just lacks the the uh, sorry the levity or brevity. You know, it's a little too. You know, when you think Cronenberg, you want a little like this is fun, crazy like Michael Ironside and Scanners. Um, you know, um, James Woods and Jennifer Jason Leigh is great. I'm glad she got brought back. Because he, I don't know, he's got a weird ensemble at times. Because he had um, Ian Holm. Um, I, you think he doesn't work with a lot of people, and then you stop and really think about it. Like, oh yeah, Viggo Mortensen was his Bobby De Niro to... For three movies. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but Possessor, good prac. I mean, good practical effects, and I think the computer works great in it. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, when I look at our reviews, our ratings on Letterboxd, it's like, we're very close. Usually one person gives it a half star more, one person a half star less, but, uh, you know, other thing, things I've noted, like, you know, I do kind of sit back and realize, like, why did we have to cast Leslie Nielsen in every comedy in the 90s? Because, hey, um, Mel Brooks is Van Helsing. I was down for that. I mean, especially the, especially the staking scene. Yeah. And just a little, she's, I think she's just a little, she's dead enough. And something I've really noticed is staking has become far more efficient in modern vampire movies. I mean, you can say, oh, well, you can put a load of shotgun, and you can load the stake in a shotgun, like, like Blade. And it's like, no, I really think ever since um, John Travolta shoved that hypodermic needle into Uma Thurman's heart in Pulp Fiction, like, I think we stopped and realized, oh, it's that easy? Little anger, and Boom. I'm just, as I say, Harker's, or John Harker is even, and I know that much about Bram Stoker's Dracula, are just incompetent. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I look back and I say, I sent the tweet out, and I said, yeah, I think Dracula 2000 kind of fits in that nice mo nice middle ground. <laughs> no, it's far less superior, at least production to 79, but I think, again, at least it comes back to the camp. Yeah. And it's great for Wes Craven's name. And hey, it's got Nathan Fillion in it. And really, can you badmouth too many Nathan Fillion projects? So, have you been watching any other horror movies of late? Um, no, but... Because uh, I've been catching up on a few. We were talking earlier. I caught mm -hmm. up with uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. Thing, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's just a Blu-ray that's always... I mean, I've had forever. Uh, we were talking about... Um, what was on Criterion, and I recently did actually take Gregory Carl up on getting a Shutter subscription, which now it just tells you that if you want the original 2010 Netflix experience, you need you need a um, something like HBO Max, who still likes their movies, thankfully. Yeah. Criterion Channel, um, is, or or Criterion Channel. And then Shudder, and I think you got what Netflix was back right. in 2010. That was the good stuff. Yes, I do want Allie's password, but that's solely because Stranger Things 4 is coming. There's eventually Witcher 2. There's shows I did like. Yeah. Um, looking at some of the other horror films I've been looking at, and I've been poking around, mm -hmm. you know. All the different levels. Oh, you, know? you, you, you as Disney I say, you kitty, got Disney kitty films. Um, and and you, you have more nerve. I'm kind of on the fence about. I haven't watched it yet. It's definitely there. I did mm. dig um, Star Wars: Tales of Terror. Hmm. You bring Christian Slater to do a voice. It's usually gold. Um, I really liked uh, Joe Dante's The Burbs. Yeah, I did see that on yours. Um, Dante, I don't know. I have not seen enough Joe Dante. I mean, I've seen a lot of Piranha, which is good. Um, what what I got? Well, Dante just kind of had bad luck. I oh, mean, 
Second, si- second Civil War, that would really left Brown. a bad taste. And, of course, my mom was a fan of Second Civil War, so I should have been a little more ready but for that. I, I like Don, Dante's films. I, I don't quite love his work the way a lot of genre fans do, but no, I understand I, um, why people love it. Yes. And I, I am really fond of Explorers. Oh, no, that's definitely been one. I mean, and he, I think Shaw Factory's getting to that and one speaking of shout, Fa- shout factory i did see the uh, Coraline disc yeah uh, when i was at best buy yeah they're uh, working recently. through all the like films yes yeah, so um but the burbs um uh, i think it's a better use of Corey feldman than lost boys is um, it might be Corey feldman's magnum opus <laughs> okay well that's it that... is i'm the casts dante tends to assemble for his movies are always oh, interesting. Yes. But I think the verbs kind of takes to the next level with how quirky it gets in terms of the casting, and I'm here for it. Oh. Bruce Dern with the brownies. <laughs> I I really, I've always just come in on something weird immediately happening when I come in on that movie, and it's like, yeah, yeah no, I'm not, not ready for this. This isn't like Tommy Boy where... Um, somebody was starting to watch it at work, and I said, "Oh," and I hear him. Me too. Shut up, Brandon. Oh, you're watching Tommy Boy. Yeah, I've never actually watched it beginning to end. I just, you know, I know once somebody brings up, you know, I, I, everybody's just put the jokes into the zeitgeist by this point. Yeah, that that's a problem with a lot of comedies. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Not to say that we really spoke of any jokes prior, like, besides the phone bit prior to the, uh, uh, Chris Farley's girlfriend in the movie threatening to kill children. And I'm, I don't know why I put that I'm a podcaster, like, on my dating profiles, it's like, okay, the people young, young enough that need to rush to have children probably don't dig these ideas. And uh, never mind the total lack of maturity when you listen to this podcast on my behalf. I am a bloody Toys R Us kid, all right? Give me that diaper and shave my head. That's an amazing Colossal Man joke, but... Oh, yeah. I don't want to grow up. I don't want to grow anymore. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I don't want to grow anymore. I'm a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> um, Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'm right now. It's more like okay, I gotta make time for movies that are actually getting to the cinema now. But uh, and then of course my ne- next Netflix DVD is gonna be John JFK's a special edition. So that's a gonna be a take it right out of the envelope. Watch it <laughs> on Tuesday. So yeah, I can't really. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I'm trying to stay excited. I finished Loki recently. Right. And, um, yeah, I don't know why somebody at war at uh, GameStop told me, uh, cause I, what was I buying? Oh, something Marvel related. Oh, have you watched Loki? <laughs> I mean, have you watched, uh, um, what if? No, I'm still finishing. Oh, you gotta finish Loki before you watch what if? Like, okay, this seems a little too weird. <laughs> And then it's after, like, I guess people are saying, at least on AV Club, that uh, Marvel is solely stuck, can't do anything separate from the to- from the timeline now because of What If. Um, so, but yeah, I can't really say. Um, I mean, I got Shudder now, and it's got all the, mo- like, besides for Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, which, again, I told you, geez, you had more nerve, because I remember seeing that on Bravo's. Uh, 100 scariest movies list yeah and it's like seeing the bit where they're um i mean a lot of blurriness in this uh scene where they're watching their uh tape of their murder and then he pulls it he hits stops what do you want to do i want to watch it again like be kind we wind um like that's kind of been too dark and like i thought that was way too dark for me to even get into. Um, you got through it. You gave it four. Mm-hmm. So. It is, uh, it is a very cold film. Yes. And that works to its advantage. I, I, I can see so. why it was as deeply controversial as it was, though, especially at the time. It 
was one looking at Wikipedia. This was basically one of the th movies that pretty much forced the MPAA's hand as to coming up with NC seventeen. Okay, that's interesting. Um, no, I was trying to see. Like, oh, I have a VPN. I can work around. I can find it free somewhere. She saw it on Criterion. I really should probably hit her up. It for is it. on Tubi with ads. It didn't pull it up recently. Hmm. That's odd. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, because I think I saw it on Tubi maybe when I was looking through Don't Go. And like, oh, don't go in the house. That's a video nasty. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. Oh, so you're showing me the uh, UK cut. <laughs> yeah. That was a lit down. It's like, don't, like, one, it shouldn't be don't go in the house. It's don't get in the car. But, like, I mean, there's some great bits in that movie. Like, oh, well, I know they're trying to do Italian horror, but Maniac does it a lot better. Which is one I saw. That, you see, that's just a weird thing. Like, okay, everybody, Tom Savini, best shotgun special effect. I'm all down for that one, but I guess uh, uh, Henry Portrait of Serial Killer just seemed a little too um, inside your own head type thing, like um, psychological or yeah, yeah. So, but um, thinking about John Carpenter, I do have In the Mouth of Madness. I picked that one up uh -huh. when it was cheap. To watch, um, I've already watched. I haven't the... seen it yet, but people see that there seems to be a serious cult around that one. Yeah, because it well, didn't really get talked up much at the time, from what I recall. Well, I've seen is um, I've seen the other two films in the um, Apocalypse trilogy. trilogy. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but, um, they Prin call it Prince of Darkness, and was the thing the thing Prince of Darkness yeah. and In the Mouth of Madness, right? Um, and yeah, Prince of, Prince of Darkness is is really good. Um, but um, it was definitely kind of there. There is a sense that it kind of feels like a hangover from show to, um, Big Trouble in Little China, because you got so much of this. You got so much of the similar same cast coming for that one. Yeah. Alice Cooper is a home, homeless uh, Satanist. You gotta like that. You, that should sell you on the movie to begin with. And it's the first thing I first time I ever got uh, exposure to uh, Schrodinger's cat. So, um, but yeah, um, otherwise, uh, as I say, I still got to look into, it's basically more of a tactic to get more guests on the show. Oh, I want to do this movie. It's too bloody long. <laughs> 90 minutes. Like, come on. It's the per 90 minutes perfect time. Like how long do you want a movie to, to be, how much, how long do you want the Netflix to be if the point is the end chill? And it's like, you know, I don't want to bin, like, now with binging television, like, you can get lost in that. It's good time frame, you know. And now you're, you know, you watch a 90-minute movie, and now your local news, or yeah. in, my ca in my case, and now The Daily Show. Like, yeah, I, I'm totally out of touch without cable, I guess. Not to say that I was watching the local news compared to The Daily Show. But I didn't even know there was going to be a hockey team 30 minutes away from me. Right. So that would be the Vermilion County um, Bobcats. It's like, that town is the size of Pekin. Like, eh, but, so, so you're not really excited about any movies coming up? No, I just can't. My new policy, self-made policy of waiting ten years or so to wait for the awards contenders and stuff. To yes. Go. Oh. Oh. Yeah. No. They, they. It's a constant from Bill Simmons on the Ringer for yeah. the rewatchables. No, they really should do the Oscars like five years <laughs> after, after the year that they're supposed to do them in. But just, I'm just not feeling a lot of it. You know, I've grown out of Disney animation at yeah. this point. Although oh. I think part of it is they. I've seen some some people say that the problem with Disney now is that they feel more like what the knockoff Disney films of the 90s were like, yeah. just in shiny CGI, and that they don't feel quite like 
feel pure. Right. And, I can see and, that. And Kanto, uh, I just feel it's suspicious about the plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And that it's musical. Mm-hmm. It It's one of those movies that reminds me of from the lovely animated show Bluey. There's an episode where they go to the movies. And it's a Disney style musical they're watching. And, at and one Disney point, is showing this show on their networks. It's been very popular for Oh them. no, no. It's Every, kind of hilarious everyone that loves Bluey. Yeah, but it's a kind of a stinging little parody of Disney films as you could do on a show that's aimed at a preschool audience. I wish I was a different Ugh, their songs. <laughs> and then later when they're in the lobby and they're and they're chatting about something. I'm trying to get the line exactly right, but I know it's going to probably be a paraphrase. Look, May, I'm pretty sure that in the end, everyone will like that the monkey was different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's because Encanto sounds like that one of those kind of movies. Well, I, it, it, the problem is they have Pixar, and Pixar usually knocks it out of the park. I don't know. Pixar's had four movies in the past few years that just haven't made much of a mark at all, if you think about it. Oh, well, I'm still, like, um, there was a ringer. Like, pop- post-Toy Story 4, they really well, haven't. I mean, Coco was the last one that really hit with me. Um, there's not much love towards um, um, the one with Chris Pratt. See? Onward. Yeah. Over, if I'm calling the actors out. And that's something we should never have gotten to with Disney. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's I like think it's okay to say intercourse robbery. They're just, not, they're just not sticking. Although you could also say that about what Disney's done. Well, I and mean, I, soul, is, soul is something I still need to get around to. I mean, you're giving me death, nine inch nails, and... and and cats like no I, I i gotta get there um yeah no i mean it it's very much like i will say that the marvel television series have kept me intrigued that yeah i want to see how these people we don't know work out uh shen chi is you know is doing well and it can't be shown in china so that tells you how good it is um and the eternals probably can't be shown in china it's good that we're i mean i i i I try my best to cheer on the communist overlords but it's good we're getting away from that and well uh looking here what what we have the rest of the year i guess i am interested in the french dispatch the next oh yes i mean it's it's a um uh, what is it a anthology film so which is what of a sort yeah yeah which i'm um i still gotta i i'm an edgar wright nut so of course i'm gonna um see last evening soho right so, uh, uh yeah last night in soho, soho but... and um then there's still um for me there is the resident evil movie i want to yeah. see how they do this right uh may like i am curious about steven spielberg's west side story it just seems like it's going to be way too much. I don't know. I don't think too much is a bad thing to shoot for right now. If anything, I think one reason I've been so relatively underwhelmed by newer movies in recent years is that they don't go far enough. I mean, you go back to these older films. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not... Like, you didn't exactly go and run to... Um, Ready Player One. I liked it, but you had no intention of ever seeing that. I did see it eventually on video, and I liked it. Okay, all right. Well, I'm just saying it's like, and boom, everything in your face. No, I don't want everything in my face. Now, you're absolutely right that there's nothing. Like, you're getting hit with facades Mm -hmm. and not actual content behind the punches. Yeah. I mean, I... That's what I mean. I think it's... I, I think West Side Story just sounds like it's going to be too much. It's like, it's Steven Spielberg. He's like, I don't know. I, I can't think of the last subtle thing he's really done. 
What about the post? Oh. You know. That's the thing we for Spielberg almost yes, at this we, point we, we just take that guy uh, for granted, granted at this no, point and because you're absolutely he's worked pretty consistently. Uh, yeah, no, he does a movie a year. At yeah, least roughly, and at this point. He's, you know, only Steven Soderbergh throws more crap on crap at the at us. Yeah. And that's that all depends if Steven Steven Soderbergh's in a move to do anything. Yeah. But I've kind of fallen out of the whole franchise of Palooza thing. Oh no, no. We we're Look, I do, as I say, I think MCU is intri- is intriguing me enough. Um, I will say, I've, um, it's it's very weird that it's because of Julia Louise Dreyfus. Like, huh, I don't know if I'm going to meet. She's in the stinger of Black Widow. All right, I'm there. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, she's She was great in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It's like, what if, what if, um... Okay, I, I don't want to... I can't remember the name of her character on Seinfeld. Elaine. Elaine. Yeah, what if Elaine was the uh, um, the president on Veep? But instead of you know, just an incompetent woman as a president. So, uh, but yeah, no, franchises... I don't know. If, if In a perfect world... With the exception of Star Wars material, we should take a 10-year hiatus. Andrew Yang, run on that. Because you always got something cool that people will get behind. They won't get behind you, but they'll get right behind your ideas. A 10-year freeze on franchises. You tell me Michael B. Jordan can't keep that heat up for... 10 years you know for 10 years so you can finally do creed 3 <laughs> but so. again it i'm just not sure where it's going i'm just not particularly interested in the holiday season releases and it's a stacked holiday though that's just it and yes a lot of it is franchise as i say okay i'm up i'm up for ghostbusters yeah resident evil yeah i still gotta watch venom yeah I mean, I'm feeling like Peter Griffin riding Falcor. <laughs> yeah! Um, so, but I think a lot of that solely is just because of the pandemic, and we're finally getting everything out now. Well, also, there's the fact that of all the movies we've had released so far since the pandemic began, now that we are catching up... I don't see any movie that's managed to really capture people's imaginations and be what everybody talks about for more than that first weekend at most. Right. No, we're... I mean, we had stuff like the Snake Eyes movie, Come and Go. I heard that was the good, Pic- but... The Pixar movies haven't stuck. Mm. I mean, the response to Luca was... A lot of the response to Luca was, you know, okay. Pixar just isn't that good anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I wanted to see Luca, so um, it's just very difficult. Maybe, to... maybe we, we, we just all grew out of Pixar. <laughs> I know, no. I, I think it's... I think adulthood sucks. And not, uh, like, oh, I mean, I can't... Like, how many video games have I owned that I haven't gotten even open to play? It's like... Dang it, I gotta actually go and do shit. (sighs) Like, you know, some people say, oh, I would never quit working if I won the lottery. Like, you'd need something like that. No, no, no. I got movies. Mm -hmm. I got video games. And I'll have the money for porn star. You know, that is a but (laughs) I digress. Like, so um yeah well let's see um any um new stuff with your gold bloom friends uh not really you know we're just we're just waiting on the next season of his show Mm -hmm. on disney plus which drops november so they they, all the other stuff so they go and talk about that on your uh thing and i took the note for some point Uh, on uh the complete works. Yes. I don't know if they're going to talk about the show. Mm. I know they did with their Nicolas Cage 
season, which they periodically go back to now, mm. they did cover the history of swear word show he did. So oh, okay. maybe we'll see something like that with World According to. But we have a while to go there. They're only just getting to Man of the Year this week. Oh, geez. Yeah, they so... got a while to go. Yeah, yeah. But the big Disney Plus Day thing next month for the two-year anniversary is when they're going to drop a bunch of stuff at once, including right. the next season of The Mandalorian starts. And they're going to drop like the first half. They're doing the next season of Mandalorian? I thought it was just Book of Boba Fett. Three. Yeah. It, season three starts on November 12th. Oh, I thought that was Book of Boba Fett. I, not... I think that's that might be later. I don't know. They're supposed to be dropping a whole bunch of stuff that day. Like with World According to Jeff Goldblum, they're going to drop the first five episodes that day. And that's like half the season yeah. as I remember it being announced. Oh, I do have the I do have the boys look forward to now that I think about it. But, um, right. Dang, November no, that's November Trump eight episodes. Sixteen November thirtieth. Yeah, no, the third season's twenty twenty two, so it's it's gonna be um um Book of Boba Fett, I right. think, drops. So I don't know. I, well, no, even on Robot Chicken's continuity, Boba Fett did get out of the Sarlacc. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, at least, I don't know. I really just... I need a Star Wars movie. That's where I'm at, really, when it comes to cinema. I'm just, I'm just trying to numb myself for the lack of Star Wars. Like... Kidding Fat now it's Disney, but I'm like, come on, Disney, get in touch with Fathom Events and drop the first two episodes on the big screen. There. Mando kicks Doctor Who's butt. Okay, now I'm just trying to get a reaction. So Yeah, that starts I guess they're gonna start running that new season of Doctor Who on Halloween. Mm. And I can't find a consistent explanation as to how many episodes we're supposed to have. For those who don't know, the season of Doctor Who is... is the last... Of... Yeah, it's the last for Jodie Whittaker. And it's supposed to be one storyline over X amount of episodes plus some specials in 2022. Mm. But it's not clear if it's eight episodes plus the specials or six episodes plus the specials. Yeah. It's getting really unclear. And I'm not sure about where it's going to be streaming beyond BBC America app, because I know HBO Max has the show. I'm not sure if they're going to have a day and date. Well, um, Which is important for some people I know who, you know, don't have cable, but they do have HBO Max. Well, and, hey, um, let's see. This is not a paid promotion. Because <laughs> I've tried looking up the information, and I can't find, yeah, okay. find it. Well, um, it. let me see. Well, I can um, I can attest though that malware bites privacy VPN does allow you to watch services like Fight TV to watch your AEW commercial free, which would be um, as long as you say you're not in the United States so Canada probably, and this would mean that you can get the BB the BBC iPlayer. And watch it stateside. So, um, never mind. There's BritBox. I think that's BBC anyhow. But all right. So now we're just killing time. So, um, yep. So you know where to find me on Twitter. That's at catbusrus. That's at c a t b u s r u s s. So as I say, five star reviews if you like the podcast hate directed to twitter just help me with the algorithm folks and you can find all my writings at main event of the dead dot com and uh i know where he's twitter but i'm not going to give that you the best place to get to get in touch with the poetic critic his letterboxd and that's the poetic critic all one word don't get thrown off from those two C's. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, thanks Stacia Harden for being my inspiration and keeping me doing this creative shit. And, you know, 
making sure everybody you cared about you, you touched, is doing fine. So thanks again to the Poetic Critic. You're welcome. And we'll see you next week. Can I hear a wahoo? This podcast is protected under the laws of the United States and other countries. Unauthorized duplication, distribution, or exhibition may result in civil liability, criminal prosecution, and the wrath of the tall man. (laughs) Boy!